This is Dan Schneider on this Dan Schneider video interview. The subject is James Bond. We'll be talking about the Bond universe, the books, the man behind Bond, Ian Fleming, uh, the films, and everything else related to James Bond. I have three experts who will guide us, and the conversation will begin in a moment. James Bond is the subject. It is probably the longest running of uh, film series uh, in Hollywood history, certainly, and world history, probably. Uh, and uh, James Bond was uh, first a fictional character devised by Ian Fleming in a series of novels. And I have three experts that will talk about uh, all things related to Bond. They are Jeremy Black on the left, Stefan Backman in the center, and Skip Willman on the right. Uh, Jeremy, if I could ask you to give a little bit of background about yourself, things you have written about Bond, uh, any books, websites, uh, things like that. Well, I'm a professor of history at the University of Exeter in England. I've written a book called The Politics of James Bond, and I've got another book coming out later this year called The World of James Bond. And my approach is largely that of an historian trying to locate Bond in terms of the developing nature of British culture, geopolitics, um, and international relations in the 20th and early 21st centuries. So you would be more taking a sociological look how Bond has evolved from the post-World War II years through the 21st century then? I'd say more a political and cultural one, but that would be my essential approach, yes. I'm not particularly interested in discourse. I'm not particularly interested in theory. I'm interested in practicality, the nuts and bolts. Okay. Uh, Stefan Backman, if you could give a little background about yourself and your interest in Bond. I became a Bond fan when I was 12. And when I was 17, I started a Swedish James Bond fan club. And I also started a James Bond shop where people could order posters and so on. And uh, after a few years, I, I've been working in the film industry since I was 17. And uh, been a Bond fan ever since. And now I have my own blog about the literary James Bond. Well, when you say the literary, are you more concerned with the books than the films? Or do you equally focus on both? I only focus on books regarding James Bond, so it's both films and the novels. Oh, okay. So, so there's a book, book about anything that concerns ah, okay. Bond. Uh, and finally, Skip Willman, if you could give a little bit of background about yourself and your interest in James Bond. Uh, I am a uh, associate professor of English in, at the University of South Dakota. Uh, my interest in Bond goes back, like Stephen. Uh, to my early days watching Bond movies on ABC on Sunday nights with my father and the rest of the family. Uh, I became interested in Bond kind of professionally uh, at the when I was invited to help co-host uh, a conference on James Bond back in 2003. Uh, we edited a collection of essays from that uh, called Ian Fleming and James Bond, The Cultural Politics of 007. And uh, unlike Jeremy, I am more of a theory head. Uh, and so I'm interested in kind of how uh, ideology worked uh, from a Marxist and Lacanian psychoanalytic perspective in the work of James Bond. And I have attempted to do that in a couple of different essays. Okay. Well, let's uh, start uh, with Ian Fleming. Um, he sort of is the archetypal World War II figure. I guess he and Graham Greene are probably the two uh, British writers uh, that are most associated, I guess, with World War II and the Cold War era. Uh, Graham Greene, I guess, is probably considered the more literary of the two. Um, but let's talk about who Ian Fleming was. Let me start with you, Jeremy. Uh, can you give just a, a slight precis pre of uh, who uh, Fleming was? He was born in 1908 into a very wealthy uh, British banking family. His father was a conservative member of parliament who in fact died uh, fighting in World War I. Uh, he grew up in a world of privilege, went to Eton, the leading public school by which the English, curiously enough, mean private school in the country. Um, and um, he failed in a career in the army because essentially he lacked self-discipline, did a little bit in the financial sector, and then, like quite a few members of his generation who survived, the war made him. He was excited by the war. He had a career in naval intelligence, not a career in the field, but a career in being involved in projects to do with espionage. After the war, uh, he was a journalist or a journalist executive, 
Uh, he married his mistress, which I'm told is not a good thing to do because she was a very expensive mistress. And with the very high taxation of the late 40s and the early 50s, he started writing novels in order to make money. And that's the background to the first novel, Casino Royale, which appeared in 1953. Was, uh, in your opinion, do you think uh, Fleming was uh, a writer on par with someone like a Graham Greene, or was he just basically a pulp novelist, sort of the spy equivalent of a Dashiell Hammett? I'm not sure I would necessarily see a contrast between the high and the low tradition. And I mean, some great novelists have written just for money. Anthony Trollope, for example, one of the greatest 19th century English novelists, did so just simply because he wanted to afford his lifestyle on top of the money he got as a post office executive. So no, I wouldn't necessarily see that. Fleming was writing in a tradition of adventure fiction. And, you know, it, he doesn't have the literary style, shall we say, of Graham Greene, or of the greatest novelist of that period, which was George Orwell, the greatest novelist of the uh, of the 1940s, although Orwell himself went to Eton like, um, like Fleming did. But he, he has a, as it were, a pretension to literary style. And so I wouldn't say that it's just simply page-turning pulp fiction. Uh, would you say, in your opinion, Jeremy, that uh, Bond was a, a well-sketched-out character, that, uh, that the world that he lived in, at least in the books, was fairly realistic to what Fleming experienced, or was it more the over-the-top stuff with, you know, the stuff we associate from the films? No, he was very different in the novels to the films, in all sorts of ways. In the novels, he doesn't like killing people. He has frequent and increasingly frequent sort of mental breakdowns. And the details of his life are given much more fully in the novels than in the films. For example, we're told exactly how much he earns. We're told exactly what he likes to have for lunch. We're told a whole host of details about him. We're told what he likes to do in the evenings. We're told what his hobbies are. So we learn much more about him in the novels. Now, is he a fully rounded character? Well, I mean, what does one mean by a fully rounded character? Are, are any of us? I'm not sure I'm a fully rounded character. You may well be, but I'm not sure I am. But insofar as you're given information about him, you get much more in the novels than in the films. Okay. Well, Stefan, let me turn to you and your opinion. Well, first, your take on Fleming, and then also Bond as a character. Uh, just like uh, was just mentioned, it's it's the you, you get to travel to the mind of James Bond in the books, which where you don't get to travel in in, in the films, and also uh, isn't. Bond more of a blunt instrument in, in, in the films than he is in the books. That's that's sort of how I, I see it. Um, but I don't I don't think that Fleming earned as much money in the beginning for the books. I I, I mean in, in the in the biographies it's mentioned that he, he didn't earn that much money from the books. It, it escalated later on. Mm. Uh, no, you're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. He didn't. But the reason he started was to, he wanted to earn money. And yeah, he, yeah. He, could, he wanted, he hoped that the books, <laughs> the film rights of the books would be yeah. sold. And what he was very frustrated about was that it took a long time, in his eyes, a long time to break into Hollywood. Well, wasn't that because... But I also, I, I also think that he somehow was a bit bored uh, after 40 and so on uh, with his life and he had two, two months off each year in Jamaica and somehow I, it's, it's so weird and it's, I, I shouldn't say it because uh, everyone else is saying it about themselves but, but I suffer from something that's called um, mental illness for, for being bored all the time. I need to activate myself constantly and, and it's, it's in, in the modern world it's called ADHD yeah. And, and, and I'm, I'm quite sure that Fleming had something like that. He was bored uh, when, when nothing was happening, and a lot of things happened during the war, so he was occupied by that. But later on, uh, after the war, he wasn't as occupied as he, he wanted to be. Mental restlessness, it's called. Okay. Well, when we turn to Skip Willman, uh, what is your take on Fleming, the man and the author, as well as Bond, the creation, at least in the novels? Well, I think, uh, building off something that Jeremy said, I think that uh, Humberto Eco in his essay, Narrative Structures of Fleming, 
talks a lot about the fact that there's this turn away from psychology. And I think it's a problematic claim because you still do learn a lot about Jim Kwan's kind of mental state, even if it's not directly explored in some kind of first-person omniscient narrative point of view or anything. But I think there is a sense in which Fleming kind of lost interest in developing that psychology that was important to him. And he became more of a blunt instrument at a certain point in time. But uh, clearly, you know, when you get to something like uh, You Only Live Twice, there is a sense of damage and mental uh, trauma, at any rate, that uh, he is dealing with. So to say, yeah, I, I don't necessarily totally agree with what Alberto Echo says. Um, my own interest in Fleming is kind of evolved into uh, his relationship with the CIA and the formation of the CIA early in the 1940s. He took a trip with uh, John Godfrey, uh, and I think it was either 1940 or 1941, in an attempt to lobby the U.S. government to create a central intelligence agency, um, and uh, Ian Fleming stayed on for a couple of weeks to help draft the uh, memorandum or memoranda about what this central intelligence agency should look like. And this is something explored by uh, writer, I think, uh, Wedge, uh, where they detail a lot of Flint's influence on that early CIA. Yeah. Well, let me uh, ask uh, just one, one uh, si silly little question. That's, uh, was the line shaken not stirred in regard to his drinks? Uh, was that from the books originally? or Because I, I remember as a child in the 70s, I read about four or five of the original books. That was when Roger it's Moore was... It's from the books. It's from the books? Um, yeah, it's from Casino Real, the first one. Okay. Yeah. Dan, can I just take up something? I agree yeah. entirely with what Skip said. I think he's absolutely right. But also, in, on you, in, in You Only Live Twice, what's interesting is there's not only the ennui, as it were, of the character of Bond, but also the ennui, as it were, of the character of Blofeld. And what one can almost suggest is that Fleming himself, who by that stage, the early 1960s, was drinking and smoking himself to death, and he yeah. dies of a heart attack in 1964, he represents or sees himself as representing an old world of nobility and knowing how to do the right thing and having some sort of purpose, and that in a way he sees that world as starting to run out. I think that there is a kind of despair in his character, um, and that despair reflects Fleming himself. Now yes. that is totally different to the James Bond of the films. It's not just that the, that the others have so correctly said he's a blunt instrument. He's also not introspective, he's not troubled, whereas the character in the novels is troubled. Yeah, let me just, a think, let me just ask about uh, uh, Fleming the man during World War II, because uh, there's, I think, some confusion. Was he someone who is out in the field? Because I recently read the, the biography of Roald Dahl, and he was certainly someone who was a, a jet, a, a plane f f a flyer in, in Greece and northern, northern Africa and whatnot. He had these real-life adventures. Or was Fleming more just a, a, a bureaucrat but back, uh, you know, in England, basically sending out spies to do the works? And was Bond more a, a fantasy of his, or was that reflective of his life? Right. Fleming did travel. He goes to Portugal, to Spain, to the West Indies, and to America. Those are essentially, in the case of America and the West Indies, those are essentially the conferences. Portugal, particularly Lisbon and Estoril, its suburb, was a major, um, how shall one put it, major place where the spies of various countries used to meet each other, spy on each other. It was a major abwehr station, the station of the uh, German military intelligence. Um, so Fleming's presence there is itself instructive. But what he was not doing was going into the field in occupied um, France or occupied Balkans in order to take part in blunt edge killing of people. Jeremy? He was involved in the sense of uh, organizing an intelligence gathering yes, yes, I agree. I, that it would go in and attempt to gather the you know, no, whatever was there. Not not I mean, he doesn't kill people, whereas the one thing that Bond is, and that Bond describes, Bond is asked in Casino Royale, how he 
gets his double O status. And he says he gets his double O status by killing two people. And he yeah. describes the two briefly the two people he's killed. Now, to the best of our knowledge, Fleming did not kill anybody. I'm not saying that makes him a better or a worse person. I'm just saying there is an element of remove from the world he is describing as a result of that. At the closest, I, I, I would assume that uh, the closest Ian Fleming comes to James Bond is the guys who, who he sent out on missions, sort of. Yes, yes. Well, let's talk about uh, the James Bond books in the 50s. And as famously, I think it was... Uh, an interview with either Candidate Kennedy or maybe JFK was the president at the time, that he was reading one of the uh, Fleming books on Bond, and that's what sort of kick-started Hollywood's interest in him. Is that is that really true, or was that just uh, a gradual process? Because I know he had radio and comic books and also uh, a television uh, appearance, uh, I believe, here in the U.S. Uh, as James Bond uh, in one of the 1950s anthology series here in the U.S. Uh, was it a slow-growing process, or was it really one of those things that the JFK uh, reading of the book uh, and, and mentioned, did that really set off the Bond mania? Not, not, as, not as films, yeah. uh, but, but apparently the increase of sales of books in the U.S. Uh, was very high uh, from that list. I believe it was in the Life magazine. Uh, that uh, from Russia would love what's on play six or something, mm. and that that interest uh, that that gave it more interesting to read the books. But but later on, Fleming and and well, no, not Fleming, but but they tried to to go to Cannes to 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 make interest in in in, in the film of Thunderball before they made Doctor No, and before Harry Saltzman and, and Broccoli came about. So, so, but that never happened either. So, so, so but, but as, as early as that, I'm sorry, it immersed Fleming then in a whole bunch of legal battles when he adopted the plot for his novel Thunderball that he had worked with McClory on and uh, led to just serious issues. In 1954, I believe that there, there was a TV uh, version of Casino Royale in, in, in the US and uh, but it, it never got anywhere. It wasn't. It's, the interesting thing is that it was aired live. It was the whole episode was live, mm -hmm. and it only took place in like one room. It was a long time ago I saw it, uh, but but it 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 was live. It, it's not like today where you cut and paste, cut yeah. and paste. But 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 it, it, the Casino Royale version was live, and he was American, I believe, in in, in that. Yes, he was Jimmy Bond. Yeah. And uh, Peter Lorre was in it too, if I remember yeah. correctly, and he might have played Le Chiffre. Mm -hmm. so. And I believe in, in, in my early um, Casino Royale paperback, it's just Jimmy Bond on the backside as well. Um, Dan, yeah. stupid question. Um, there was a long genesis before he appeared in film. Uh, but in the early 60s, I mean, Skip's work shows the way in which there was references by both the Kennedy, uh, the JFK and Robert Kennedy, um, and obviously uh, Fleming stayed in the White House. But I think more specific, more generally, there was a sort of cultural moment then in which Bond appears very attractive to a strand of American culture, so that you see Bond being a uh, frequently in the Playboy magazine and uh, Fleming is asked to write and writes a series of short stories for Playboy. So I think that in a way American public culture at that point of the Cold War was very different to American public culture in 1954, 55, 56 and in a sense it may not be surprising that it proved easier to make a success with the films then because initially the funding for the first film was that of what in Britain we would call a B picture but the success of it pushes it up the scale and more money is then put in and therefore it, it gathers it gathers steam let me oh, go ahead skip you have something to say i was just going to say i mean a couple quick notes i think um in bond and beyond uh, tony bennett and janet walcott talked a lot about the realization of from russia with love in 1957 as a kind of key cultural moment that launches 
uh, Bond in Great Britain, and Jeremy can correct me if I'm wrong on this. Uh, but the other thing is, is that uh, the paperback revolution was kind of important to the success of Bond. And uh, Bennett and Wilcott also talked about the fact that 10 of the first 18 million sellers in paperback for Penguin were Fleming novels. Hmm. Well, let me uh, talk about the novels one more time, one final point before we move on. Um, in the films, uh, especially in the 1960s, the dominant uh, Bond rival organization is Spectre. But that wasn't, I don't believe, in the books. Wasn't it called Smirsh or something? And if so, was why wasn't... Uh, why wasn't Bond battling the real KGB? Was there some reason that the British government didn't want uh, to have published uh, secrets or that... Uh... No, no, no. The, the initial books, he's against the Soviets, in okay. particular against Smirsh, and he's against um, Soviet military intelligence, in effect. Mm -hmm. uh, but what happens is that in three of the books, uh, beginning with Thunderball, he comes up against Spectre, and Spectre is a free-floating organization. And writers on the novels from a wide variety of backgrounds have talked about the move to Spectre as an element of the engagement more with fantasy. And then people have speculated as to whether this is to do with the decline of Britain after the Suez Crisis of 1956, whether it's to do with uh, Fleming's private despair, you know, people sort of uh, uh, offer a number of interpretations, but Spectre is a very different body to Smirsh because Spectre is not located within the Cold War as a protagonist, it is, some, it is a body that, as it were, seeks to exploit the animosities of, of the Cold War, and it's that which then is uh, transferred to the film. So that films, novels in which Smirsh is the rival become in the films, films in which Spectre is the rival. Uh, Skip or Seven, any comments? And also, also remember that Thunderball was the first novel that was supposed to be a film. It was written as a film script, a manuscript for, for, for a film franchise. So maybe Fleming didn't want to use Smirsh that he had sort of created, even though it's supposed to be a legit, I uh, like a, a B department of KGB, like Schmidt Spionen. And, and, and maybe Fleming didn't want to use uh, Smirsch in his upcoming film, film version of a of, of, uh, Bond story. Do you, do you follow? It, it? Yeah. Skip, do you have a comment? Well, some writers uh, also speculate that the slight warming in the Cold War in the late 50s and early 60s had something to do with uh, Fleming abandoning uh, Smirsch for Spectre, but, you know, with the Bay of Pigs and uh, Cuban Missile yeah. Crisis, maybe that wasn't exactly true. I just noticed a few days ago that the word Spectra is mentioned two or three times in Diamonds Are Forever that was published in 1956. Not as an organization, but you use the word in that book also. Um, let me talk about then how uh, this transitioned into the first film, because Saltzman and Broccoli uh, were the duo that uh, maintained the rights to, to the, I guess, canonical James Bond on film. Uh, but both of them, from what I've seen documentaries and, and read up on them, these they were not like, uh, they were not big name producers at the time. Bond basically made them. Did they just luck out in getting the rights to the film? Or who, what, was there a, a bidding contest? Or was there really no interest until Dr. No became a hit? Very poor interest, I would say. And also it was Harry Saltzman who had the, the rights first, but he didn't have any funding. And Broccoli approached him saying, I would like to, to, to uh, buy the rights from you. But Harry Saltzman said, oh, Bond, that's not interesting. I want to do this picture instead. And then finally they agreed upon doing the first Bond film together. But there, I, I, I can't see any huge interest in, in the, the films. A Casino Royale was already sold to, to uh, Colombia, I believe who were able to do the spoof movie in 1967 with David Niven. Yeah. 
initially, you're absolutely right, Dan. Initially, it was not at the front line of um, filmmaking. I mean, if you compare it with the Hitchcock films of the late 50s, for example, uh, this is a very much initially sort of second division stuff. Uh, what is interesting is how it becomes so successful. Well, let me talk about them. Oh, really, oh, go ahead. Let me just mention, uh, they were really bold, bold when it comes to the marketing of the film because they said in, in, in the adverts, it said the first Bond film. And as they sort of anticipated that since there had been more books, they anticipated that there would be more films even during the marketing of the first one, yeah. pre-release. Well, I'm just going to add that yeah. there is a uh, interesting documentary about Salzman and Broccoli yeah, that you it. can watch that does detail kind of their early involvement in the in the whole film production early on. Uh, I want to talk then about the casting of Connery because there's a lot of sort of legends that you hear about who was supposed to play it. Uh, I've I've heard just to give a few of them off the top of the head that Fleming always favored David Niven who played Bond in the the spoof version of Casino Royale in 67. I've heard that uh, Patrick McGowan who was at the time uh, doing the Secret Agent Man or Danger Man series in the UK was and later The Prisoner uh, was supposed to be uh, was offered the role. Then I've heard that uh, Roger Moore uh, who later became Bond but was then Simon Templar in The Saint was uh, supposed to be it. And then I'm actually looking here online at a uh, cartoon rendition of James, uh, John McCluskey's uh, version of Bond in the comic strips. And damn, it looks a hell of a lot like uh, Connery. I don't know if that was before Connery took over the role or, or after. So uh, what can, can any of you sort of set straight? How did Connery get the role? Was he the first choice? Was it Niven? Was it McGowan? Or, you know, how was Connery initially cast? He was not the first choice. Um, and and just, really, just, just let me just say that, according to the book, the James Bond Archives that was released a few years ago, the, the Ian Fleming's first choice was actually Roger Moore. But he was, but Broccoli told him that he, he wouldn't be able to do it because he was up, uh, up during uh, Simon Templar at the moment, the same. But according to that book, uh, it's Ian Fleming's first choice was Roger Moore. Yeah. Uh, Jeremy and, and the, the series by John McCluskey was released uh, pre Sean Connery. Okay. Uh, Jeremy or Skip, do you have any comments on that? Well, I think the point is that uh, Sean Connery is an effective character, a sort of mid Atlantic character. Uh, able to operate in what was then the world's leading film market, which was the United States, and the second most significant film market, which was uh, Britain. Um, the point I would make is that Connery does not sound as though his voice is marinated in the English class system, and that I think was quite important in the in choosing somebody who would not be defined. Uh, simply or largely in terms of the British film market. I would just add that evidently Fleming became quite, uh, after the fact, he became quite happy with the casting of Sean Connery, even though, as I heard, it was David Niven that he ultimately envisioned as his, his Bond character. Yeah. Uh, finally, let, before I end this segment, and we'll talk about the film specifically, was there, was there the the idea of the Bond girl in each of the films? Uh, was uh, was there always like you know Octopussy or some some female at the center of the books, or was that mainly a creation of the films? Oh no, it was in the books. Yeah. Women are very important in the books, and. Um, in many senses, the women in the books are much more dramatic than the women in the films. Mm -hmm. So if you look at Pussy Galore in Goldfinger, Pussy Galore in the film is essentially a competent sex symbol. Pussy Galore in the well is introduced as running a lesbian motorcycle gang, which for the average reader of an adventure story of the 50s was really quite wild. What I would say about the, the novels is that and this to me is very interesting from the point of view of cultural or social history, that the novels, 
largely precede what we call the 1960s in cultural terms. But the interesting thing is that women in the novels are defined neither by a search for matrimony with Bond, nor for a search for, with motherhood. These are women who want to have uncomplicated sex and to then move on. And that, I think, is really quite radical, because if you go back to previous um, stories, if you go back to Dick Barton, who was the one immediately before um, in Britain, I mean, Dick Barton is squeaky clean. I mean, you know, girls aren't really there, and they're there to, as it were, be rescued from the metaphorical railway tracks. So I think that the, the women is a, are a very important aspect of what made the novels distinctive in the 50s and what made them be successful. Skip. Do you agree, do you agree when I say, say, say that uh, most of the women in the books were actually far more uh, modern and, and, and able to take care of themselves and so on, you know, uh, like, like, like the revolution of today, sort of. Do you understand what I'm trying to say? That they are equal, sort of, to Bond in the novels, more of some of them, like Tiffany Case and, and, and so on. Um, final uh, question. Uh, what do you think that was that set James Bond, the the figure within the books, apart from other 1950s uh, spy type characters? Uh, I believe Matt Helm, which later became sort of a spoof of the Bond film series with Dean Martin, was also a spy character that had... Uh, that had been developed early in the 50s. We mentioned Simon Templer, the same goes back to the 20s or 30s. Uh, Mickey Spillane had Mike Hammer, the hard-boiled detective. But none of these characters, even though they may have had films made about them, they never reached the iconic status that Bond did in the films. Do you think it was some germ within Fleming's prose or the, his characterization of Bond? Or do you think it was just that the Bond films made Bond the phenomenon rather than the, the Fleming books. Yes. Yeah. Well, I think one of the interesting things, and Michael Denning talks about this in his book and cover stories on uh, British espionage fiction or intelligence fiction, is that uh, Bond came around kind of at the right time and the right place when the Cold War, at the beginning of the Cold War, and we have that kind of sea change from detective fiction to espionage fiction, as well as the emergence of you know, discourses of pornography and tourism. And, you know, Bond films and Bond uh, books are all about kind of location and exploring the thrilling cities of Istanbul or, or whatever. Um, so there is, this, there is a sense in which the women are very important in sp certain kind of specific ways, as well as location. And all of these things, the Cold War, pornography, the connection to Playboy, and uh, tourism, I think, all factor in, for Denning at any rate, uh, to kind of attribute, that's how Denning attributes the success of the Bond novels into the films. Dan, one of the things is that I think it's worth bearing in mind is that Bond can be seen as the last of what's known as clubland heroes. That phrase has been used to describe uh, adventure heroes of a upper-class background in English novels of the uh, interwar years, or British novels of the interwar years. And Bond, as Fleming created him, is an upper-class individual with plenty of private money, um, who knows how to behave, who knows how to go to the leading clubs in the country, and is, in a sense, an anachronism to the democratic or demotic world that has come along. One of the fascinating aspects of the transition from novel to film is that that class aspect is democratised. But in a way, I think it's the skill of the filmmakers that created the mass bond, not the skill of Fleming. Because Fleming was writing in, a, in one respect with the sexuality, a modernised position of the clubland hero, but nevertheless, Bond is a clubland hero. Well, let's uh, end this segment here, and in the next segment, we'll talk about the Bond film, starting with Dr. No, and we'll do that in a moment. Well, we've been talking about James Bond and his creator, Ian Fleming. We've talked about uh, the pre film Bond. Uh, let's talk about the first film, Dr. No. We mentioned a little bit uh, about Connery being cast. Uh, in the day that it was released, 1962, uh, 
Bond films, at least in the UK, came out during what was known as the kitchen sink drama era. You had a, a lot of uh, great social uh, films. Uh, I think maybe in the same year or, or a year later, there was a great film, The Sporting Life, Lindsay Anderson's first film with Richard Harris. And Richard Harris plays this very rugged kind of character that's uh, very much a Connery type role. Uh, but uh, then Connery comes along in, in Dr. No. And the first thing that I, in re-watching Dr. No uh, a while back uh, on the film was, it's so clearly a science fiction film right from the get-go. Uh, and it's not, it's not in any way, we, we are not in that kitchen sink drama world of, of the UK of the early 60s. We are in full-fledged science fiction mode. And I'm wondering if that was part of the appeal uh, uh, of Bond, that he wasn't just uh, the spy who came in from the cold, but here in Dr. No, he's fully engaged in a different world. Uh, Jeremy, if you want to go first. Uh, yes, I think that's very true. I mean, I think the, you know, the rockets made it very much modern. I think that's without a doubt. Um, I mean, as far as the location is concerned, it starts with old-fashioned imperial Britain and the old-fashioned empire, a sort of card game and, and gambling in London, both of which is the world of the old. And then, of course, Bond gets thrust into a new adventure against a timetable of missile tests in Florida, which, which Britain can't control, and where the, Britain's opponents, or America's opponents as well, have a very clear geopolitical interest, and that is very modern, and I think successfully so. I think Dr. No is actually works very well in creating a drama against a time sequence. Stefan, I'll skip. Well, I would, I would just say that, you know, the, the uh, space race obviously had something to do with that, um, and Soviets put people in space, and Kennedy's call for the moon by the end of this 1960s. So I, I think that had something to do with the kind of science fictionalization uh, of Doc no, although kind of there in the novel. But I think that helps explain its popularity in 62. Stefan, you have a comment? Yeah, I, I agree. I, I, I just believe that maybe I'm a bit younger, so I don't see it as a sci-fi movie, because sci-fi movies to me is like Star Wars and so on. Well, was Dr. No the character, was he as uh, blatantly mad scientist-y as he was uh, in the film, as he, in, in back in the book? Because he has the, the, the I guess you call it robotic or metal hand that, I mean, he's got super strength in, in the film. Was that from the original book or is that something just added on for the films? I think it's fair to say the film accentuates his tendencies. I mean, he is an unusual character in the novel, not least because his heart is on the wrong side of his body. That's the main thing. Um, and therefore, when he's shot dead by the Tong, he survives. Um, but I agree with you, and I agree you know, with the others. I think there is a location in the space race that's important and that helps to give the film a kind of modern feel to it, uh, which is very different to the world of pushing around in Bentleys and, you know, speaking French in in, uh, in casinos where one's wearing a dinner jacket. That's That becomes rapidly anachronistic in the film. Yeah. If I remember correctly, the novel ends with Bond having a fight with a giant trained octopus, right? Uh, squid, I think it is. Squid, squid, excuse me. Yeah, I, I, I think that would have been very hard to film. So, <laughs> yeah. uh, for something else, I think. Yeah, I um, think that's right. And <laughs> you know in the novel gets killed by having an enormous dump of guano put on top of it. So that, again, was not as dramatic as what happens in the film. The film is much more dramatic. Yeah. At an early stage at an early stage of the, of the script for Dr. No, the bad guy was actually on a monkey. Yeah. Huh. Um, that also features uh, Ursula Anders' emergence from the uh, the seas. Uh, you know, it's, she's the first uh, Bond girl. That's probably one of the most famous uh, moments, not only in that series, but certainly in all of action movies, if not films, when she emerges. But uh, I, I, if, I, if I'm correct, and it's been about a year since I watched it again, uh, it's actually in the second film from Russia with Love that we get the first Bond teaser before the credits. Uh, isn't it? Uh, and that, that became an important part of Bond. It's almost like a, a little mini-movie before the actual movie. Uh, is that correct? 
Yes, what you get is this teaser in which apparently Bond is being killed, and it turns out, in fact, that it's somebody with a rubber mask on his face, um, and uh, that uh, this is a lie, as it were, test to show that the Robert Shaw character, how ruthless and brilliant he can be. Uh, the teaser, as you say, becomes very important. Sometimes it has virtually nothing to do with the film. Sometimes it is It is mixed in with the film. And of course, what it brings out and why the teaser is interesting is it brings out, and um, I thought Skip with his reference to Umberto Eco was spot on here, it brings out the element of which a repetitive structure in which the reader or the viewer knows what is going to happen is very important to their relaxation and enjoyment. I mean, you, you, you do know what's going to happen in the Bond film. He will be at some stage captured. The megalomaniac will reveal his plans and then Bond will, will escape and the megalomaniac will get killed. And you know along the way that you will have a series of adventures. And that, in a sense, is very relaxing for the audience. Um, I mean, it's interesting that if you compare them with what in some respects technically were better films, the Len Dayton films, I think in many senses, A Funeral in Berlin was the technically best 1960s spy film. A uh, Funeral in Berlin works on the basis that you never know what's going on. And you never have the faintest idea what is going to happen. Well, there is a degree to which the Bond film is much more user-friendly than the three films of the Len Dayton novels. And it's no surprise that the Len Dayton sequence ran out. Well, let me talk a, a bit about Bond in these early films. Um, uh, in Dr. No, uh, I think a, f a spy comes back to his room to try to kill him. Bond is sitting in the seat, waits there. The guy turns around, and Bond could have basically arrested him or, or whatnot, but he just coldly shoots the guy, which brings up the, the idea that I guess goes back even to the books. Uh, is Bond really a hero? Or is he an anti-hero? And an anti-hero meaning someone who walks the line of grayness. Because there is, even in that very early Connery personification, that this guy is a stone-cold killer. You know, he's not the Bruce Wayne that, that says, I'm not going to, to kill the, these scumbags. I'm working. Uh, even right then, Connery has no conscience, it seems, in, in easily dispatching this, these people. Well, can I just say briefly yeah. on that? First of all, in the novels, he does have a conscience yeah. about killing people. Uh, so we're just talking now about the film. It's yeah. different film. In that specific moment when he shoots dead the geologist, the geologist himself has been revealed as a real piece of work. Yeah. So let's be clear about this. Um, you, you don't really have any sympathy for him. A number of the critics at the time said, oh, this was all very wrong and all the rest of it, which I have to say shows how wet behind the ears they were. But that's, you know, <laughs> the, the idea that a secret agent's job is to act as a sort of branch of the judiciary in which everything is going to be reviewed nicely by a group of sort of lawyers around a table is not really actually what was going on in the early 60s. It may be the case now. I've heard the uh, two last uh, heads of MI6 denying that under his control anybody was killed. That might be the case now, but it certainly wouldn't have described the situation in the early 60s. And actually, what precisely, when you have a country, we're talking, and Dan, I think you've forgotten this, at that stage, Britain still had the death penalty. The death penalty still existed for treason. So in a sense, to kill somebody in the field, which is what Bond is doing, is not that terrible a thing. Hmm. Um, you mentioned... Uh, and also... Uh, oh, God. Go ahead. Uh, 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 I believe that Sean Connery plays six uh, uh, rounds of ammunition in, 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 in hmm. Professor Dent's body. And then the sensors needed to have it cut down. They were just... Okay, fading in and out a, a little bit, Stefan. Uh, but yeah, the, you said that I guess the sensors had some something to do with that. Let me just turn. Uh, I think you mentioned MI6. That's the real world. Uh, sorry, sorry. Yeah, that's the real world British uh, uh, agency. Uh, in the Bond world, it's MI5. Is that correct? works for MI6, it's called the Secret Intelligence Service, which is the other term for MI6. Uh -huh. MI6 in 
Britain is the agency that deals with espionage activities outside Britain and it answers to the Foreign Secretary. Mm -hmm. uh, MI5 is counter espionage within Britain and okay. it op op operates answers to the Home Secretary, the Home Office, the Home Secretary. So they're two different intelligence services in Britain. Um, and Bond is located with MI6. Okay. Uh, Skip, like let, me, let me ask you about uh, uh, that. Go ahead. I was just going to say, it's like the difference between the CIA and the FBI. One has domestic duties, one has kind of foreign duties, one has, you know, the FBI is more police, counterintelligence, counterintelligence duties as well. Yeah. Um, with the second film, from what I've read, and I, I, I have uh, one of those collected Bonds DVDs, uh, uh, and they had those documentaries with Salzman and Broccoli and whatnot. Uh, and I re recall on one of the behind-the-scenes featurettes, uh, they said that uh, from Russia with Love, uh, that I guess there was some negative feedback that they got about being too science fiction with Dr. No, which is why from Russia with Love is basically more of an old-time, I guess you'd call Hitchcockian uh, type of thriller. Is that correct? That I think it's certainly, it's certainly more true to the Fleming novel. Yeah. Yes, I would say it's true to the Fleming novel, and Fleming himself was operating with that novel uh, against the background of Eric Ambler's novels. And Eric Ambler, who was a novelist who Fleming much admired, publicly admired, uh, had written novels set in uh, Istanbul. And this kind of Balkan, I, Balkan novel about uh, spy fiction goes on, you know, it goes a long way back. And as Skip says, it's uh, it's true. In, in a way, it works. It works very, it works very successfully. The biggest difference to the novel is that in the novel, the villains are Smirsh, and in the film, the villains are Spectre, and that, the, that Spectre is trying to play off uh, the Soviet Union against Britain. So there's that is the difference. But otherwise, as Skip says, it's pretty close to the to the novel. Yeah. Um, let me talk about then the third film, because that's actually the first Bond film I ever saw, Goldfinger. And I remember I saw it on TV in the U.S., I guess when it was first broadcast in the early 70s. Uh, so that was the, my first introduction to a Bond film. And from what I've uh, read, that went beyond the first two films in terms of making Bond, you know, an international icon. That was sort of the Star Wars of its era in terms of marketing. Uh, there were Bond games, Bond uh, action figures, Bond uh, of lunchboxes, etc. Um, was that really uh, the thing that really, I guess, cemented Bond uh, uh, in the, the public consciousness worldwide? Yes, commercially it was the most successful hitherto at that stage, uh, not just in the number of people that sat in the, uh, in the cinema, but also the speed with which people came in. It saw not only very great success in Britain and the United States, but also enormous success in West Germany, in France, in Italy and in Japan. So it, it was a much more successful global product, and they spent more money on it. The um, success of the first two it enabled them to spend more money. So you get the famous Ken Adams sets, yeah. the, uh, in particular the set um, in, in Fort Knox, but also the set in uh, Goldfinger's headquarters. And it gives you a, an excitement. I think there's still to this day an excitement. There are one or two uh, things that don't read well today, um, uh, Bond's treatment of women in Miami at the beginning of Dink, a uh, female character, doesn't read well, and um, the sort of rather nauseating conversation in his sports car with the woman he meets there about uh, about the games that they like playing, that reads as though something terribly wrong in the class system, but otherwise it still works pretty well, and for a film which is now over 50 years old, this is really quite impressive. Uh, Stefano Skip, any comments about uh, Goldfinger? Goldfinger had a new, new director, Terence Young directed the first two, and then Guy Hamilton did his first with Goldfinger. And also, it uh, has this enormous scenes with the Aston Martin and DB5 that helped an enormous amount uh, with, with, with the kids being totally. What to call, I don't know what to call it, but they, they, they really love the car and so on. I would just add that uh, one of the interesting changes that they made in the film is to uh, make the gold in Fort Knox active as a, bringing in trains and trying to haul off all the gold, which is in the original.
original novel and so kind of an ingenious solution to a practical matter that was just completely uh, not believable in the we, novel. We, one other thing too is that uh, a Goldfinger's henchman um, whose name slips my mind, that the Asian fellow with the hat, um, he's actually played by someone of uh, East Asian descent, unlike in the first two films, I believe, where Dr. No, who's, I guess, half European, uh, is played by a white fellow in sort of yellow face, and also, uh, I think, the one of the Bond girls in the second film, or maybe it's in the first film, is also played, uh, you know, in yellow face by a white actress. Was there any pushback even that early about yellow face, and that's why they cast an Asian actor? No, they just needed somebody who was a convincing heavy, and this Japanese actor to play the Korean was. Incidentally, if you want to think in modern terms, uh, it's rather interesting that Goldfinger, uh, at one point, in order to uh, make comments about the number of people that are going to be killed on the Fort Knox, remarks that it's about the same as the number of people who die in two years' road accidents on American roads, mm. which is rather interesting. I mean, in other words, that we're prepared to accept some forms of death as if it's just, you know, what life delivers, but not others. And I thought that was actually a rather interesting thing that the, that the script puts in. Yeah. And almost f f from the day of Goldfinger, uh, the uh, the people that they uh, booked as actors uh, came from across the globe to help with the marketing because it's always easier to market a film in Italy if you have an Italian actress. Well, the last two uh, films that in the first run of Five by Connery uh, seem to build upon uh, Bond's uh, uh, cultural presence. Uh, and the thing that when I, I look at like you only live twice, uh, uh, the thing that sticks to me is that they got even more overtly science fictiony. But it's only I think in you only live twice that we see the emergence of the first Blofeld, I believe. Uh, why did it take so many films for Blofeld to uh, appear? Well, you've seen him earlier stroking the cat. I mean, yeah. you see that earlier film number two from Russia from Russia with love. But well, we don't see um, his face, do we? No, you don't see his face then. Okay. But I mean, you know, he's there. Okay. <laughs> I mean he's he is the mysterious head of Spectre. I mean that uh, and, and you know that work I mean to me that works quite well. Uh, Skip, do you have a comment? Well I think with with uh, particularly with the only live twice, I think you get into that dangerous kind of Hollywood of thinking that every film has to be bigger, better, more expensive yeah. Yeah. kind of thing. And they, I mean, the novel couldn't be more different. Uh, you know, Blofeld is running Suicide Garden in Japan. And, you know, the, the, the deaths, uh, the death tolls, you know, in the teens, it's, it's with these suicidal people coming into the garden to find exotic ways to die. Um, the, you know, the film is completely different. We've got the, the layer and the the, re re the big reveal of the plankton and uh, lots of explosions, the commando raid, and all of the special effects and, and gadgets start coming in in a big, big way. Although they were obviously there earlier, um, but it's that's that kind of I think makes that that fetishization of the various elements of the Bond films becomes very problematic, and you live twice. And it gets worse than some of the other. Yeah. Now, before we move on to uh, uh, the Connery leaving the series, I want to talk about both Casino Royale and Thunderball because those are the two uh, film versions that go outside the Eon Broccoli Saltzman uh, productions. The first one in '67, uh, Casino Royale is done as a spoof, uh, and you have David Niven as the retired Bond. Uh, you have uh, eventually it's revealed Woody Allen as Little Jimmy Bond. Uh, you have uh, a lot of stunt casting, Austin Wells as Le Chief. Uh And that was played in that very over-the-top 1960s sort of star, you know, extravaganza type way. And I think it's a, an entertaining, uh, funny little film. It's certainly not a, a great film. How did both Thunderball, which we mentioned, and Casino Royale sort of get out? Because uh, Thunderball was then remade in '83 by uh, the guy who uh, I think co-scripted with uh, with uh, Fleming. Kevin McClory. 
Yeah, so those two films have stood outside for many decades as being the two films that were redone outside of Eon. Uh, can any of you explain how they... Thunderbolt, there was a legal case yeah. as to whether Fleming had stolen the ideas. And the uh, result of the legal case was that he did not enjoy and own copyrights and was therefore not able to sell it. So therefore it was possible to make that outside the sequence. Uh, in the case of Casino Royale, as, as mentioned, it was already outside the sequence because a television version of it had been sold, and uh, so the television rights had been sold, or film rights at that stage, and, there, and those had then been made as a television film in 1954. So, you know, that, that's, that's the, back, the background for this. As to the two of them, Never Say Never Again, which is the one you're referring to as the Thunderball remake in 1983, is, I think, a much more focused film, much more successful than Casino Royale. Never Say Never Again came out the very same year as Octopussy. Yeah. And, in, you know, I think it's a much grittier and better film. I mean, the others may have different views, but I don't think necessity, I don't think of necessity a James Bond film um, is always better because it's made by the same production company and as has made most of them. Most of them. Well, when you say better, Jeremy, are you, are you saying you think that Never Say Never Again was better than Casino Royale and or better than the original Thunderball? Now, I was saying that Never Say Never Again, to my mind, was better than Octopussy, which was the okay. other film that came out that year, 1983. Okay. And I think, you know, it was a success. I think it had a very good villain, Klaus Maria Brandia, a uh, very good German actor who had appeared in Mephisto and had been very good uh, and plays it, uh, you know, as a psychopath very successfully. I think the scenes in the casino was good. I think Fatima Blush as um, as the sort of villainess was good. I think it was an impressive film. It had a sense of wit to it, which I think was also welcome. A lot of the Bond films are not very witty, and of the main sequence, the one I've always preferred is Diamonds of Forever, because Diamonds of Forever does have a sense of wit. Uh, Charles Gray as Blofeld, the uh, cross-dressing Blofeld is good. Uh, the character that plays Morton Slumber is good. There are jokes in it, whereas quite frankly, some of them are pretty grim if you're looking for any sense of humour. Uh, Skip or Stefan, do you have any comments about those two films, uh, Casino Royale and Thunderball? I think that the, the, the court case, the end of the court case, correct me if I'm wrong here, but, but wasn't it that Fleming was able to keep Thunderball as a release of a book and Kevin McClory got the rights to the film? That was sort of the, the end of the, the deal, sort of. So EO Productions had no other way than to contact Kevin McClory and do Thunderball because otherwise he would do Thunderball with someone else. Yeah. And then he kept the rights and uh, and uh, did Never Say Never Again in the 80s. He tried to do a film called Warhead in 2000 in 78, I believe. And uh, when he passed away a few years back, Never uh, EO Production was able to buy back the rights so that no one could ever do and that's why they also uh, work together with Sony Pictures because they had the Casino Royale. Hmm. Well, so now, uh, now but, your production has, has everything. They have yeah. all the film. Now. Go ahead, Skip. I was just going to say that with Thunderball, one sees the kind of topicality of the Bond films uh, as well as kind of the anticipation that Fleming had regarding what were going to be world crises, potential world crises. So missiles off the coast of Florida, you know, that's... That's the Cuban Missile Crisis, uh, nuclear proliferation. I mean, I think there's a reason why Bond has survived, and that has to do with the fact that they managed to tap into social anxieties and historical developments in kind of interesting ways and capitalize on them. Yeah. I remember... So in, in, the next, in the next film, will, will James Bond be saving Britain from Brexit? Then? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, in the 1970s, uh, there was... Uh, uh, tendency here, at least in the U.S., for to run a lot of films together a few years after their release. And I remember one time I saw a triple header of Bond films that had, I think it was 
one of the Connery films on Her Majesty's Secret Service, and then one of the early, maybe the first Roger Moore film. So I was able to see all three Bonds in one afternoon. But uh, since then, over 40 years ago, I haven't seen On Her Majesty's Secret Service. And most people sort of slag on that and that uh, Lazenby uh, did only one turn and people say that he was too green as an actor, he was too wooden. Um, is that uh, an accurate uh, assessment of that film? Is it one of the lesser Bonds and is Lazenby the worst of the Bonds? Well, the film itself it contains a lot of very good things. There are two films, two, two ski chases, which are excellent. Terry Savalas' Blofeld is superb. The music is very good. Diana Rigg is very good. Uh, Lazenby himself, he doesn't, you can't believe that he would throttle somebody to death. But then I have to tell you, you can't believe that of Moore or of Brosnan either. Um, so, you know, he wasn't a particularly brilliant Bond. He was a bit wooden. I think that, again, is a, a fair statement. Um, but, you know, I mean, in a sense, the film can still be good. We, the later Brosnan films were terrible in some respects in terms of, of Brosnan's acting. Um, and in many respects, there's more to see and on Her Majesty's Secret Service. And I'd certainly recommend the ski chases. If you want excitement in Bond films, I'd say the ski chases are some of the very best uh, going. On the emotional element, too, with the, uh, the wedding to Diana Rigg, I, mean, I think that's, that's something that you haven't seen in a lot of Bond films. And uh, Lazenby's woodenness, it was nice that they had him pretend to be Sir Hilary Bray or whatever his name is. Uh, that, that helped deflect some of the woodenness, I think, or at least give an explanation for it uh, when he's acting as this guy investigating Blofeld's uh, roots, social roots. And the broccolis has al have always said uh, that uh, the, what George Lazenby is saying is true, that he, he, wasn't, he wasn't kicked off the films, he was, he was uh, turning them down. Yeah, I actually remember seeing an, a documentary where after the first film, uh, Lazenby did say he didn't want to do anymore. I guess he thought this had made him a big enough star and he wanted to do more of those kitchen sink type dramas, real cinema. Um, but uh, let me just talk briefly but before we go when, back. Oh, go, oh, go ahead. Uh, when, when I, I talked to George Lazenby actually last year and he, and he said that one would need to remember that it was flower power, it was good stuff yeah. and everything. And, and, and he believed that Bond was out. Yeah. Yeah. No one was interested in, in the tuxedo guy anymore. Well, let me just talk about a, a, a fan theory, and I'm sure you've all heard this before, and which has necessitated the a constant replenishing of Bond over the almost 60 years now of his uh, filmic presence. And that is that uh, at least in the film world of James Bond, James Bond is sort of an honorary title, and the 007 is a designation that's passed on to, I guess, the alpha male in the British uh, uh, spy business. Um, and in fact, I believe in Casino Royale, the, the first film version, the spoof, I think David Niven actually outright states that. Uh, he says that he was the original Bond back in the 30s, and now some other bloke is uh, running around, meaning the Sean Connery Bond. Uh, is is that in the Bond universe? Is the Bond universe sort of like what we would think of comic strips, where Bruce Wayne and and Superman and all Spider Man don't age, or is at least in the film universe, does the the passing on of the Bond mantle make more sense? Well, the character doesn't age because yeah. obviously, as you point out, I mean it would have been going for more than sixty years. I think what you could say is that. Um, with Bond or with Sherlock Holmes or with Hercule Poirot and also, of course, with the American equivalents, what you've got is some a character who is presented as timeless. Now, that mm. is always a problem yeah. and it always puts a lot of weight on whether the actor, and you can see this with Sherlock Holmes films, whether the actor chooses to represent the character as it was originally done or whether to tries for a more modern rendition. Now, on the whole, on the whole, what has happened with Bond is it goes on in some respects having some characteristics of the original film character, in other words, being able to kill lots of people, operating from a fundamentally benign organisation, though that was questioned very much in the last film. 
But on the other hand, his social mannerisms in terms of smoking, womanizing, and drinking all change. So there are elements of change and there are elements of continuity. Uh, Skip, do you have a comment on that? Well, I, I think that what Bond kind of represents is mastery in that masculine sense. And so he's a master out in the field, he's a master in the bedroom, he's a master of, you know, lines, all of this kind of stuff. And as our senses of masculinity and mastery change, Bond is going to adapt a little bit like towards those kind of things. So we get a little nod towards feminism and, and something like uh, Casino Royale, the new Daniel Craig with M being portrayed by Judy Dench. Um, but there are still there's still lots of elements of continuity. But I think mastery is the key thing that we, we want to see in that creative work as and as a model for behavior. Stefan, do you have any comment about the, that fan theory of Bond being a mantle passed on? No, I, I think that the rest of the team has, has talked really well here. Well, let me then move on to the Roger Moore segment, because when we talk about uh, Bond, and I'm comparing him to some comic book characters, I, I grew up, like I said, I, I saw on television, I saw uh, first the uh, Goldfinger, but the first Bond I saw in the, the film was... Uh, uh, which one was it? In seventy three, uh, "Live and Let Die" with uh, die. with the Paul McCartney score, and and to me, Roger Moore was uh, James Bond in the sense that he did these cartoonish things, and and he played it like he was James Bond in a cartoon. There was a sense that the Roger Moore Bond was aware of his sort of fictive being, in a sense. Um, Am I correct, do you think, in assessing it that way, that the, there was a sort of breaking of the fourth wall in the Roger Moore films where it was like, you know, wink and nod, this is all so silly, but, you know, God, I'm having fun? Well, I think Live and Let Die is actually not a bad film. I mean, if you yeah. look at it again, I saw it again recently, I think it's not a bad film. And some of the films actually had very large, you know, profits. I mean, Moonraker was one of the most profitable films. So I think, you know, there, there is a standard. I mean, you know, I'm older than you, and uh, for me, obviously, Connery was the person that created yeah. Bond. And there was a tendency, is a tendency, to regard more as a weaker Bond. I think it's simply, it's different. Yeah. You know, filmmakers are not obliged to go on with the same kind of rendition. I made the point that you would find it difficult to imagine more throttling somebody with his bare hands, but then on the other hand, that was not what the film audience wanted to see. Yeah. So in a, in a sense, we blame, as it were, the filmmaker or the actor for delivering something that was actually very comfortable to go and see. My critique would not be of the more films than the 70s. What I would say is they went on too long. Yeah. So the last one, A View to a Kill, 1985, was I think particularly weak. And by that stage, he did seem tired. And the, the and the actually this whole the whole sequence, the whole film, all aspects of it seemed tired. And I think you could say that possibly of the last three of the more films. But some of the earlier ones, The Spy Who Loved Me, is still a really good film to watch. Yeah, I think, I personally, I think that, along with uh, Goldfinger, to me, are the two best classic Bond films. And it brought Jaws, which was this really, I think, goofy character that, uh, you know, back in the 70s, I, when people said Jaws, you thought of either the shark or the Bond character. That They, they came to mind. Uh, Stefan, do you have a comment about the Roger Moore years? Well, they, they, I'm not too fond of them. No. Uh, maybe because they are a bit more tongue-in-cheek than, than, than the Connery ones. Uh, but one thing that's... Uh, since, since I was born in 76, I find it most funny that, that for instance, the, the Dalton films and the Brostons films, they have aged in my world. Uh, but the others, the, the, the early Roger Moore films and, and the Sean Connery one, has not aged due to the fact that they are taking place so much earlier than I was born. Yeah. Skip, do you have a comment about Roger Moore and his, uh, his oeuvre? Well, Dan, I think you're right that there's uh, there's a kind of camp element to Roger Moore's performance. But I mean, I think there really is a serious kind of dilemma for a filmmaker 
once you have established this character, you know, and Connery has kind of definitively established the character, how, how do you grapple with that change of mantle or what have you? And I think they adopted a kind of interesting, you know, as you said, kind of a wink to this past uh, of Bond and kind of drawing attention to it. I know I think it got increasingly tired and, and certainly by a view to a kill, it was, it was done. Uh, but I think there is, you know, there is at least an effort to grapple with that problem within the films themselves that the filmmakers were very, very much aware of. And for those, for those of us who were fans from the, you know, fans of the Connery years, uh, it's nice that they at least acknowledge that there is a certain kind of gap between the Moore and the, and the Connery performance. Uh, well, and I believe, uh, if if I'm correct, in one of the, and I forget which one, in one of the Moore films. Moore acknowledges his marriage to Diana Rigg as played by the Lazenby character. I forget which film it is in. So that would seem to, to kibosh that whole fan theory. Yes, in, in, for your eyes, in, the, in the pre-title sequence of For Your Eyes Only. Yeah. Yes. Uh, yes. That's what's happening. And, and that was due, due to the fact that... Uh, that was due to the fact that they were... looking to step in after what Roger Moore wanted more as a salary. So you, you broke up a little bit there, Stefan, but uh, let me let me then turn to the Timothy Dalton well, years. Just as the same reason why I... Okay. Oh, well, sorry. let me let me just uh, turn to the Timothy Dalton. He only did two films, and I have to say... Uh, um, like I said, uh, Moore was in a sense the first Bond to me. Although I saw both Thunderball and Goldfinger on television, uh, there was something I think off to me about the Timothy Dalton portrayal. And I think Dalton was a very good actor, and I, I've seen him in other more serious, if you will, quote unquote, serious roles. And I think he's quite a good actor, but he didn't seem to have the suaveness, the glibness that both Moore and Connery at his best had. Uh, and I, I, like I said, I don't really remember the Lazenby adaptation, but when I think of, uh, uh, he seemed miscast. Uh, what was, uh, uh, let me start, let me start this time with Skip. What was your take uh, on the two uh, films with Dalton? Do you think that he was miscast in the role and was he happy in the role from what I've read? Well, I think it seems to me that what they tried to do was to do what they ended up doing with Daniel Craig, making it a more gritty, kind of slightly more realistic, slightly. Um, and they recognized they had a real deal actor in Dalton and tried to exploit that. I just think that they did a not very good job of exploiting this wonderful actor. Yeah. So I would say that the problems are not necessarily with Dalton, although he might have miscast, but that the scripts just didn't quite live up to it. And I think the antagonists in those films don't quite carry the same yeah. gravitas that Blofeld does for some of the other uh, villains that they have. And this was during the Glasnost era with the Soviet Union falling apart. So they were, I believe, trying to move Bond away from just being a quote-unquote spy to sort of being uh, an all-around uh, world-trotting uh, good guy. Yeah, and it gets drug dealers and things yeah. like that. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Stefan, uh, how about you? What What is your take on Timothy Dalton's uh, performances? For, for a very, very long time, he was my favorite one. Yeah. And that was mainly due to maybe the fact that he wanted to go back and visit the, the, the novels and, and, and the way James Bond were in the novels. So. Yeah. How, about you, uh, how about you, Jeremy? What is your take on the two Timothy Dalton roles? Well, it was certainly similar to the novels. I think there's no doubt about that. He plays an introspective character. Um, I think that um, he never really relaxed into the role. There was a woodenness about him, and I think there was an element in which it, he was like Lazenby in that respect. I agree entirely with Skip. I think that they were poorly structured and badly scripted. Uh, there were some moments that were good. Sanchez as a villain is pretty good, and um, 
the uh, the character, the evangelical, the fake evangelical preacher selling drugs into America through the television channel. I thought that was actually, again, a rather brilliant, humorous uh, element. But nevertheless, they are ones which are very jumbled when you look back at them now. And I think Dalton was pleased to move out of the role. And I think from the point of view of the, of the film fans, it was good that he did as well. Now, the, the next guy to take over was Pierce Brosnan, and he had become a television star uh, here in the U.S., and for many years, he was uh, rumored to have, you know, become the next Bond, and I think I've only seen two of, the, of his films. I saw the first one, Goldeneye, and was the one with Halle Berry, The World Is Not Enough, was that the Halle Berry one? No, it was called Die Another Day. Die, okay, that was the last one. So I saw the first and the last of the Brosnan films, and... To me, they were both, you know, okay, solid. But it seemed to me that uh, uh, Bond was passe. Uh, when I when I watch Brosnan uh, and I compare him, even even to say the best of the the late seventies or mid to late seventies more films, there's something about Bond in this era. And the first one, of course, was pre nine eleven. Uh, it, it seems to be just going through the motions. Um, what what is the take of, of you guys? Because I mean. Brosnan was, I, I think, a good, solid enough actor, but uh, b the character and, and the whole world of Bond at that time seemed to be just sort of anachronistic in a sense. Can I turn that round? I yeah. actually think Brosnan was not a good Bond. No? I thought, thought he was rather unimpressive, a bit mm. of a marionette, uh, wearing nice outfits. I thought the first film, Goldeneye, was genuinely interesting. Um, they really interesting villain and with the suggestion that the British had done bad things in the past. I think that was a, a successful film and with M, uh, you know, Judy Dench's M was good. I thought, think the first half an hour, maybe 40 minutes of Tomorrow Never Dies is a really good film, really exciting in Afghanistan or on the Russian border and then in Hamburg. Uh, I think that's really brilliant, and the, all the scenes in the uh, t in the newspaper printing and next door. I think the rest of the Brosnan stuff is quite frankly pretty awful, and I think the one in North Korea is absolutely ridiculous. So, I, and and I'm not sure that this has got anything to do with a lack of certainty of setting. Um, if you have that amount of money and with that many things going on in the world, you ought to be able to devise a new plot. It's not as though you have to produce one a year. I'm, I'm afraid to say they had a poor actor and on the whole, uh, they didn't do much good after the beginning of, that se of those sequences. The Brosnan really in the latter films was, was not good. And I noticed the Times newspaper recently carried out a poll of a certain number of self-opinionated experts, but I noticed they put uh, most of the Brosnan films down the bottom of their list in terms of preference. Yeah. Uh, Stefan, what's your take on the Brosnan films? Pretty much the same, except that I was really young at the time. I was like 17, so I was more forgiving, uh, and I really enjoyed Pierce Brosnan especially in Goldeneye and Tomorrow Never Dies. But I think that uh, what Brosnan wanted to do what, what uh, Craig has been able to do, to go back more to the books, sort of, and, and be more uh, silent and, and harsh and, and, and so on. But, but at, at that time, the broccolis didn't listen. Because during uh, The Living Daylight and License to Kill, but was struggling in the U.S. to make revenue, so they were trying to make more Americanized films with with uh, Brosnan. Yeah, Skip, what, what's your take on uh, the Brosnan years? Well, I think Goldeneye. I I love Goldeneye for some reason. I just love it. But I I think that after that it really falls off. The opening sequence of Goldeneye, where that that Russian dam with Sean Bean uh, and the plane that takes off and falls down. I mean, that's exciting stuff. I think, again, trying to explore what the post-Soviet world would look like and what are the dangers of that world, I thought well, was an interesting idea. I mean, I think other ideas were interesting, and kind of the Rupert Murdoch character uh, in, I don't even remember which film it was, but by, uh, what's well, his name? Um, interesting idea and just ludicrous uh, kind of ideas there. But 
they're still tapping into real social and cultural anxieties and, and historical hot spots of kind of uh, political troubles. So I think it just didn't quite come together in the other films. And I'm not, after Goldeneye, I thought Rosman was good, but then the rest of the films, he became kind of a caricature of himself. Yeah. I, it was ridiculous. Well, let me let me move beyond uh, before we hit the Daniel Craig era. I want to just talk about a, a couple of things throughout the whole Bond series. Um, the initial partnership of Broccoli and Saltzman split in I think the mid seventies. I think maybe the first Moore film was their last film together, and I think uh, The Spy Who Loved Me was the first only Broccoli film. What precipitated that? And do you think that? Uh, Something was lost when Saltzman left. That the the broccolis, because to me, by by the end of the eighties, the classic Bond is 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 gone. Do you think that the uh, 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 Saltzman's leaving the partnership uh, was a, a blow that the, the series has not really particularly recovered? I mean, they may have made some good films here or there, but it's James Bond is no longer what he was in the sixties or seventies, iconically. Uh, I would say. Go ahead. Yeah, anyone? I would say that uh, what I, I think is one of the big problems might be the Jason Bourne films making such huge uh, revenue uh, across the globe. And um, the Broccoli's went a little bit afraid that that what might be what, what people wanted. Uh, Jeremy, do you have a comment? Yes. I mean, I. <laughs> I'm actually, you know, it's, it's rather difficult to be thinking in terms of failure when it's still commercially very successful. I mean, obviously, critical plaudits are another matter. Um, you know, they're not, they're, they are a global product. As a global product, they possibly now are overly action films and overly violent, and I think you could certainly say that the kind of lengthy sequence you had in Goldfinger, in which playing a game of golf, uh, James Bond and Goldfinger uh, established their character without any violence, that would be virtually impossible in a film made in the last 25 years, but that's because it's now uh, films in which their profitability in large part rests on in markets which are not primarily English speaking um, and at that respect I suspect that they are still very very successful I don't like the recent films the reason I don't like them is I think they're too violent to a jumble of chases and I find the, the plots and the characterization not particularly interesting but they're not making the film for old men in their 60s like me yeah. and I suspect that for the market that the desire for the global market, they're still now very successful. Skip. I would just say, one of the, and I, mean, I, I concur completely with Jeremy on this, that as, as Stephen pointed out, the, the Craig films have jumped on the Jason Bourne train and I think left a lot of the bond behind. And yet, in Casino Royale, the most exciting kind of moments were the card game. And there was very little violence. There was... Bond goes back to the room where Le Chiffre goes up there and has his little encounter, violent encounter, but that the suspense there was awesome. And there was no violence. And that I thought, wow, they're gonna make a wonderful reboot of this entire series, and then they just kind of abandon it with Quantum of Solace. Well, let me talk a little bit about some of the, the continuing characters other than Bond. Early on in uh, even the early Connery films. You had M.Q. Money Penny. I think it was maybe by the third film that Q became established as sort of the wizard of uh, the guy who could make just about anything, sort of like uh, I guess Bruce Wayne does. Uh, you know, cars that can do this. The Aston Martin. Um, have do you think that part of the iconic success of the early Bond of the first say twenty years was these minor characters? and the the gadgetry and has that been transferred successfully into the later films especially now in the daniel craig era uh, i think i mean huh. go ahead jeremy no 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 i mean I, I i'm not myself sure i mean i think the q one the special effects i think it's what people expect i think they expect spectacle that spectacle doesn't have to always be special effects, but 
they do expect spectacle, and on the whole, they're still getting the spectacle. Uh, they're getting the most amazing car chases, they're getting dramatic things. Um, unfortunately, uh, a, a driver got killed, and I think it was the penultimate. So, the, um, I, I wouldn't say that's failing. I think that the agenda that people expect is still there. I think Stefan made a very good point when he said that they're now configured to match the um, the Jason Bourne films. Lost Stefan there for a moment, but he's back. So let me uh, pick up, uh, I believe, Jeremy, you were talking a, a little bit, uh, uh, ending your uh, take on uh, uh, sort of uh, the Bond, other characters. Let me pick up with uh, a thing that has also been integral to the Bond phenomenon, and that's the, the opening title sequences and the music. And I have to say that uh, I think the Pierce Brosnan years sort of drove me away from the Bond franchises. I haven't uh, watched any of the Craig films, even though some people have, have told me uh, to watch it. And some people have said, you know, you, you might as well skip it. But I remember that, I think, horrendous Skyfall song by Adele, which I, I think is probably the worst song in the Bond franchise. And then I compare it to The Spy Who Loved Me or Goldfinger or some of the great tunes from the past. Um let me just ask culture. Do you, do you think that, uh, and I think, didn't Goldfinger maybe win a best song, a best song Oscar one year? Uh, uh, what effect do you think just culturally outside of the films uh, that the title sequences and especially the songs have had in pop culture? I think they were very stylish in the 1960s. I think yeah. you're entirely right. I think they were excellent. I think now that they're chasing the youth, uh, the youth boat, as it were, and I think it just doesn't work. I don't find the, the, the music now attractive. You know, yeah. I'm an old fox, so what I think may be totally irrelevant. Yeah. Uh, how about you, Stefan? What's your take on the Bond songs? First, I must say that Adele's song is quite good. <laughs> you do? And, uh, but, and, and, I, and I don't like The Spy You Love Me. <laughs> but, but I think that now, when we have even moved away from uh, MTV days and so on, I don't think that uh, the music of the Bond films is as special as it was long ago. It was it was more interesting uh, back then. Now it's only like amongst the true fans, maybe, who are really interested in who will sing the next song. Yeah, I think that's true. The, the filmmakers think it is an integral element of what they're they're attempting to sell, and, a, and that they think that there'll be some kind of cross germination of uh, interests or whatever. And Sam Smith and Adele, I'm not a fan of either of those two songs. Um, I I think they yeah I think there's too much made of it. Although you know, I, I still think Paul McCartney's "Live and Let Die" is awesome. Both "Finger by Sugar Bassey" awesome. And who is the fellow who actually did the opening title sequences in the 60s and 70s? Because I remember seeing a documentary about him, and they themselves were almost worth, I mean, they, they were so brilliant, especially in the first two or three, and so different from film openings of that era. You mean like if it were, were some other director or... Well, no, the, the guy who did the visual effects openings for the first, you know, 15 years or so in the Bond films, you know, they, they themselves, along with the opening title songs, were often visually spectacular. Like in Thunderball, the, the, the women are swimming. Yeah, okay. yeah, they made for the visual style. They were yeah. all part of this system in which you were, as it were, you knew you were going to a Bond film. Right. All it, of that. Yeah. They, and of course, the other thing is, you've got to remember, I mean, a number of people have referred as an antithesis to Bond, to the grittiness of other films of the 60s, 70s and 80s. And I mentioned Len Dayton, but you could, you know, there are others as well. And the point is, there is a visual opulence, which is part of the palette of the Bond films. And that visual opulence particularly in the early films, carries with it uh, the, as it were, the depiction in the titles and the running, the, all the, everything that runs with the film. Now, that at the moment just doesn't seem to work. I mean, it's either they're not trying it or cultural or, or indicators and paradigms have changed. Well, let me ask about the Daniel Craig films. As I said, I've not seen them. And I know that when the first one came out almost a decade ago, well, over a decade ago, the remake was the 
the first serious Casino Royale take. I know that sort of got uh, good reviews. How have the Craig years been, and especially compared to the prior Brosnan years, have they been an improvement, or has it sort of just gone off in its own direction, in, in your opinion? Let me start with you, Jeremy. Well, you can imagine Daniel Craig killing somebody. Uh, and to that extent, he is convincing. And the beginning of Casino Royale is powerful in that respect. Um, having said that, I do feel they are too violent, too much to do with chases, too much like the Jason Bourne films, where, quite frankly, you wonder whether the character has got any brains, Jason Bourne here, got any brain cells at all. And the last film, for example, the shootout in the Sahara, waste of time, and the whole thing was a bit of a mess. So I don't really feel it's working terribly well. Uh, the interesting thing to me is how those people writing the continuation novels are also struggling. As you may know, over the last 10 years, a number of novelists have been asked to write James Bond novels. It was for a long time just one person, first Gardner and then Benson yeah. did it. So now we've had a number of people lately. And they're all, as it were, struggling to try and get a James Bond that works on the page. So it's not really surprising that people are also struggling to get one that works on screen. Yeah. Let me talk about the 1960s. Uh, uh, oh, I'm sorry, Skip uh, and, and Stefan, let me get your take on uh, uh, the Craig years before I, I move on. Uh, Stefan, how about you? Yeah. Uh, well, I, I I think that maybe the, the Craig years are just like Brosnan years, that the first one was the best, and then it's been a little bit downhill. I mean, Quantum of Solace was a really poor film. I actually only seen it once, still. And uh, But I, I, do, I did like Skyfall. It was a sort of a good movie. And, um, but... They need, they need something a bit more fresh now, or maybe old-fashioned. Yeah. Just like Anthony Horowitz did with Trigger Mortis. Yeah. Uh, Skip, what's your, take? what's your take, Skip, well, on I, Craig? Like Stephen, I, I kind of like, I like Casino Royale, I like Skyfall, on Quantum of Solace, which is grim, and not much there to work with. And Spectre, I agree with Jeremy, was kind of all over the map, didn't quite cohere in the ways that uh, you hope movies do cohere. Um, they are kind of struggling. I can see why Daniel Craig, when, after this last film, was very, very strenuous in his resistance to doing another Bond film. Yeah. Uh, well, let me uh, talk about a step back from the films and go back and talk a little bit about the overall Bond uh, phenomenon, uh, if you want to call it that. Um, or was I correct that earlier I had set, stated that it is the longest running film series, at least in the English speaking world? Is that correct? That, that, or is something, uh, am I missing something? Yes. Is, that, no, no, no. That's what's generally said. What's also generally said is that it's it competes with Star Wars to be the most successful commercially. Hmm. That's the usual remarks that have made. And I think that's absolutely correct. Um, the other statistic that is often plucked from the air is what percentage of the world's population is believed to have watched a James Bond film. And obviously we don't know precisely, but it's a significant percentage. Well, uh, Skip, do you have something to say? No. no. Well, I know that uh, in the 1960s, I'd mentioned this earlier, there was... Uh, Dean Martin uh, had a spoof series, Matt Helm. There was films like Modesty Blaze that came out. That uh, uh, and even even some like Barbarella uh, had some of the sci-fi kind of uh, uh, Bond goofiness. You don't see that nowadays. So is that? Do you think the the fact that uh, uh, I mean, do you think that the whole Bond franchise has sort of gone a bit more abundant? And do you, do you or do you think that Bond will still be relevant and being made in twenty fifty or twenty eighty? Go ahead, Stefan. That's a hard question to answer, but if since Bond has survived for 60 years, I don't see it not surviving. It's been helping the, the, the movie franchise a lot. Mm -hmm. to, 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 I mean, the companies behind them, MGM, is only surviving due to, to uh, Bond. Mm -hmm. 
Mm. I read somewhere that they, their take is like 27 or 28 percent on a year where when bond is not released, uh, 27 percent of their of their revenue comes from bond still. Mm -hmm. So I would believe that people will st still be enjoying bond 2050, seeing um, a film every third year or something. Skip, what is your oh, go ahead. The suggestion I would make is this. I mean, I, I agree with Stefan, but I make a suggestion. We're assuming that Bond is only influential within the English speaking world. If there is the equivalent of a Bond, which is produced by either Russian or Chinese studios over the next 10 or 20 years, that will be another way in which the, uh, as it were, the idea will continue. I mean, what I suspect is. It appeals to the belief that an individual can change history, can save people, can avert calamity. And that belief is an extraordinarily attractive one to many people and also will carry a good story as far as many people are concerned. A story with adventure and chases and violence and with a um, and you know with sexuality so the the actual the agenda is there whether you call the character james bond or whether it is made by one particular studio or other is another question to the next 80 years but it'd be very surprising that, that should not be an agenda that continues how about you skip what's your take on it well my take is that the bond has survived several kind of i mean the end of the Cold War survived, the franchise survived the end of the Cold War and found a new kind of footing in the post-Soviet world and grappling with international terrorism. And I'm, I'm assuming that as long as intelligence and espionage continues to be kind of an ongoing concern, which it certainly is, uh, there will be some kind of uh, interest in reviving Bond or bond to flow precisely because I think Jeremy's absolutely right that this idea that one person can make a difference uh, is very important. I think, you know, you go back a couple of years, two of the best picture uh, nominees were Zero Dark Thirty and Argo. So the true life stories of espionage certainly, certainly thriving in this time. It's just a matter of Ken Bond uh, and the franchise, the filmmakers, uh, zero in on some of the same ideas. Well, let me let me throw something out to all of you that's, uh, I'm someone who's a writer and uh, I believe in intellectual property rights, but I think one of the things that I've noticed with a lot of uh, iconic characters, be they the Walt Disney characters, Mickey Mouse or Donald Duck, Bugs Bunny, uh, whether it's Popeye the Sailor Man or whether it's James Bond or Simon Templar, I think in recent decades we've seen the extension of copyright and I think uh, I, I'm against that. I think I think you should have uh, a creator should have a copyright for their lifetime plus maybe 20, 25 years, and then then it's in the best interest of society that a character go into public domain. And when I look at someone like Fleming who died in '64, uh, if I use my 20 or 25 year limit, Bond should have been I think a, uh, a character in the public domain by the 1990s. And I think how much more interesting Bond would have been had he been able, at least the film franchise, uh, been able to cross over into other universes. For example, if you look online, one of the biggest online argument boards, you'll find many of them is Batman versus Bond. Who's cooler? Who's better? You know, and, and, both, and Batman 2 is a character that should now long be in the public domain because it's been over 20-some years since his creator was killed. Do you think that... Uh, if we had, well, when Bond falls into public domain, which I guess would be 70 years or maybe 90 years after after the death of uh, Fleming, so you're talking mid-century, uh, what, what is your take on the public domain and characters like Bond that I think could be resuscitated if it was in the public domain? You know, James Bond yeah. versus Sherlock Holmes. You're absolutely right in the case of Sherlock Holmes. Yeah. Sherlock Holmes has been a central figure in, I think, two recent Hollywood films yeah. and in a BB successful BBC television series, which have really uh, radically reconceptualized him, particularly the BBC series. And I think that they have made a character who had become 
very formulaic. Yeah. They have made, made him very interesting. Uh, so I would agree with you. How about you, Stefan? Uh, in, in Canada, the, they are, the copyright law is different compared to the other countries. So they have actually re released uh, uh, a few James Bond books during last year and nothing happened. But uh, if, if um, I don't know, I, I, I don't know uh, if uh, we would benefit from having a numerous amount of James Bond films coming from left and right. How about you, Skip? What's your take on public domain and characters like Bond? Well, it, it seems to me that the kind of multi-universe thing that you're talking about wouldn't necessarily work for me at any rate. Uh, a Sherlock Holmes versus, versus James Bond. I think there's a very kind of uh, interesting social universe that Bond dwells in, and uh, I, I kind of like to see it there, although I totally agree with Jeremy that what they've done with Sherlock Holmes, both there's the Guy Ritchie films or the BBC production is interesting, and freeing it up from the kind of limitations of Broccoli's might be a way to save it. Well, yeah, can I just say, I think Skip's made an excellent point there, a really excellent point. There is a way in which what is, it's, what is becoming the problem with Bob is not only that it's a bit stale, it's becoming typecast to a degree that is stuck in a rather confused me mess of violence. It is just weak storylines. Uh, I think his comment on Quantum of Solace was very good. I agree with him about the last film. There is, seems to be a lack of ability to produce a coherent story. And it may be that the broccolis are so interested in the other aspects that they've lost touch with that. And possibly somebody else having the ability to make some with less money behind them Generally, people who have less money have to focus much more on the quality of the story yeah. than less on the, as it were, the theatricality. Maybe that might be better. Um, so, yes, I, I actually would like to see somebody try and make a, two types of bond. One, a bond of the 50s, which was like the stories, and two, a bond of today, rather like the redoing of Sherlock Holmes. Yeah. in which the Bond is somebody who is living in a much more fractured world, but without, as it were, completely over-the-top psychopaths trying to destroy human life as we know it. Yeah, I, uh, the reason I brought it up was because I recently watched some YouTube short films, uh, science fiction and, and, and whatnot, and there are, oh, who's, who's ringing? I'll just pick it up and put it down. It's my okay. daughter's probably on the phone. Sorry, I can't do anything about that. Okay, well... um. Uh, but I, I, so I had seen some of these YouTube uh, short films that people have made, and I think I think you're absolutely right, uh, uh, Jeremy, when you talk about uh, they're they're much more dependent on story. But you also brought up a point that I was just going to bring up was that uh, I just did a show on science fiction uh, prose, and uh, a big subgenre of science fiction is what's called steampunk, where you have characters going back into say the 19th century with quasi uh, scientific devices. Uh, in the U.S., there was a television show called The Wild Wild West when I was a boy about uh, science fiction back in the Wild West. And I was, I, I often thought, wouldn't it be good if the next Bond film was set in the 1950s? Get a Bond and set his adventures in the post-war, early Cold War years and, and the devices then. Then you could focus on the story. You wouldn't have to necessarily have the internet and, and outer space and whatnot, but but actually go back to, to the original 19... It, and it doesn't have to necessarily be the actual original books because there's going to be some things that are dated there too. You could, you could have James Bond visit America in the 1950s to have a storyline that makes more sense to modern America than dealing with the spangs in Diamonds of Forever, for example. Yeah. And that, I think, would be really interesting. You yeah. could have, if you really wanted to play an interesting story, you could have James Bond going to America in 1963 at the time of the Kennedy killings. Yeah. Now, that would be a really interesting one as to 
you know, the idea that you know, conspiracy theorists would love that one. Um, so not that he's behind the killings, but that, you know, yeah. some, another, word, another way of looking at what is going on there. But I, I just find, again, I may be that I'm becoming too old, but on the other hand, after all, a large part of the audience these days are old farms. Yeah. Um, and I just, at the moment, the idea that you succeed with films by copying the Jason Bourne for, uh, for, uh, that just doesn't work for me. Yeah. Um, how about you, Stefan or Skip? What do you think of uh, having sort of a retro Bond set in the 1950s, but made a film made today? Do you think that could reinvigorate the franchise? For us who are older, yes. But for the youngsters, no. I don't see any revenue coming in from that. I think it was... I, it was oh, go ahead, Stephen. I'm sorry. Uh, just a short, as a, as a short qu uh, answer, I, I would see that with the Marvel films, with the Star Wars films and so on, I don't see that amount of box office coming in from a film that should take place in the 50s instead of today. Sorry. I think, I think the economics of Hollywood are such that, Stefan's right, they're not, they're not going to do it for financial reasons, but I think it would be the way to go and the way to become less of a slave to the formulas that they have uh, become so addicted to uh, through their own success, I think that they have all of these kinds of chases become chases for themselves. They don't serve the story. They are the element that you have to have. We have to have the big opening. We have to have the gadget. We have to have the girl. And it doesn't serve the story. If it serves the story, go ahead and put it in. But I think that going back to the 1950s would be one way to abandon the kind of dangerous fetishization of those elements of the story that the films have been able to market very successfully for years, but are at that end. Yeah, and I think and they, they, and they did, did touch that in Skip or, or, or help, help me out here, which of the Craig film it was, but they, the first pre-title sequence or, or something was in black and white, just to make it sort of look like it was early on, because that scene was taking place in when, when Bond received his double O, which was his second that, killing. Right. Yes, they did, uh, and there they is touched on that. No, but anyway, this is very interesting because it is a cultural icon, and it does raise the question of how you can look at characters who have been there for a very long time yeah. and how they reflect changing values, and at the same time, the commercial pressures. And it's that interaction of entrepreneurship, but also cultural norms and you know, the changes in both that makes the Bond thing so fascinating. We could do exactly the same program on Superman, yeah. or we could do the same problem program on Hercule Poirot. Yeah. Well, let's uh, end this segment. In the final segment, I'll just give you your final thoughts on the Bond uh, phenomenon. We'll do that when we return. I've been speaking with uh, three experts on James Bond about the films, about the book, about Ian Fleming, Skip Willman, Stefan Backman, and uh, Jeremy Black. Let me just uh, uh, give uh, you both, uh, or all of you, rather, uh, some closing remarks. We just talked about how possible ways that the Bond franchise could be reinvigorated creatively, if not financially. Um, what... Uh, what final thoughts do you have, uh, Jeremy? I'll start with you and go right. Would uh, what final thoughts do you have about James Bond moving forward? Well, what I personally feel is that a successful novelist produced something which, through serendipity, there was no inevitability about it, becomes one of the two most successful film franchises in history. Uh, in doing so, you see the combination of entrepreneurship popular interest in the adventure story, the advantage of appearing in the Anglosphere, the extent to which the Anglo-American relationship culturally and in film terms in particular worked in the 1960s and was sustained thereafter, and a degree of globalization which ensured that a Western product could then operate effectively around the world. Obviously, in doing so, there's been, as with any major commercial product, at any major company, there's been a degree of rigidity and a degree of becoming formulaic. And I would wish and hope that the filmmakers can operate against that, although accepting that their profit largely rests on delivering the formula. But the actual idea of an adventure hero who makes a major difference on his, 
possibly in the future her own, is one that will go on succeeding whether the Bond films become formulaic or not. Stefan, what's your final thoughts about Bond? Um, that's a really... Uh, I mean, what I want them to do with the next film would be to just skip whatever happened in, in, in Spectra and, and, and leave the, the Blofeld almost being relative to Bond idea far behind. I mean, just leave that you know, a whole different ball game. But I, I don't actually have any true ideas because it's a formula and it's supposed to be like that. Mm -hmm. How about you, Skip? What is your final thoughts about Bond? Well, I think as a phenomenon that's over, you know, 60 some years old, back to the publication of Casino Royale, it's a fascinating kind of cultural barometer or window onto various societies, whether it's Great Britain in the 1950s and early 1960s or right on through to today. And I'm, I'm very interested in looking backwards, probably more than forwards, examining how these cultural productions tap into and manage the social anxieties that are there and uh, reflect them. Um, so it's, it's, it's a fascinating phenomenon, and I, I have no... I mean, Jeremy's kind of given the definitive statement here about the future of Bond and uh, uh, where it could go in terms of uh, saving it artistically, but uh, it's it's fascinating to look at, and it's it's a rich it's a rich field for a scholar to kind of dive into. Yeah, the reason I wanted to do the show and my final take on it was uh, about a year or so ago, a, a, a fan of my website had pointed me to uh, one of these web boards where it was like a Bond versus Batman and who would win. And I think it, it showed the the lack of cultural relevance Bond had and that it was like 99 to 1 that Batman would beat Bond. And I was like, I was like, boy, if, if this was 1960s and it was Sean Connery versus the Adam West Batman, it would be the absolute reverse. But, I mean, I always thought uh, in, a, in a fair fight, I would go with Bond every time because he has the British crown behind him, and no matter how rich uh, 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 Bruce Wayne was, he can't compete with the, uh, the Queen's riches, and, and Bond is a killer. He went through World War II he, uh, and, and whatnot, uh, but it just amazed me, and I, th I thought it was a good barometer of how off the cultural charts, despite how well the Craig films may have succeeded financially, uh, how sort of culturally off the charts Bond had, had gotten, uh, from my youth at, at least. Uh, but anyway, I want to thank all of you. I will link to your websites uh, below this video. Uh, both uh, Jeremy has his own website, Jeremy Black Historian at WordPress.com. Uh, then uh, James Bond, the secret agent.com is Stefan's uh, website, and then uh, I'll link to the uh, website at uh, uh, South Dakota University for Skip. So thanks again for all three of you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dan. Thank you very much.